Well, good, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for coming on such a horrible, wet and cold night. Uh, I really appreciate all you coming. Now, as David said, going back to 1969, how did I get into this? <laughs> um, it turns out in the late 60s, I wrote a weekly science column for The Age. And uh, now it turns out that a fortnight before the Ap Apollo program was to be on television and all the TV stations knew about it, but what they didn't know is that the pictures from Houston had no commentary on them. So they all spread out to all the universities uh, to find people who knew anything at all about it. As I said, I'd written some articles on uh, space travel and stuff uh, for the age at the time. So Channel 2 approached me, would I come and, I know bugger all about it. I said, don't worry about it, we have a press kit. Uh, <laughs> three inches of paper which explains everything. And it's all there, the how it works and what comes next and the timeline and you just have to read that and regurgitate it on the television. Well, yeah, right, I'll give it a go. So that's how I uh, got into this act. And uh, don't worry about the small print there. You, and no, you can't read it. I can't either. But that's just an introductory slide. Um, amongst the press kit were pictures like this, showing that there are stage one, stage two, stage three, and then the bits, uh, the uh, lunar module and the command module, and uh, there it was, uh, with things about um, it weighs 8,200 tons, or that doesn't mean anything, so I have to translate it that into, that's like 400 elephants. <laughs> and it said it's uh, uh, 36 uh, meters tall, that doesn't mean much, it's like an 11-story building, the whole thing. So you can imagine sitting on top there and looking down on the whole scenery. And uh, it said how many mega newtons of uh, thrust it takes to take this 8,200 kilogram tons up into orbit. That doesn't mean much either. What about the acceleration? Now we can feel that. Well, my Ferrari parked in Swanson Street can do 0 to 100 kilometers per hour in 10 seconds. It's pretty good. Uh, now, wait a minute. Kilometers per second, uh, the acceleration, how many kilometer, kilometers per hour per second? What do you think that's got to do with how many kilometers per second per hour? It's the same. So that means that if that Ferrari could only keep it up for an hour, it would be going at the rate of 10 kilometers per second at the end of a tenth of an hour. So uh, just sit back and have this thrust continue for a, for a, well it didn't take an hour, it only took 11 minutes for the uh, first two stages Whoops, sorry, I knew I'd do this all the time. It, it only took um, 11 minutes for the first stage and the second stage. After six minutes of that, uh, this one ignited and etc. cetera. So, uh, this is what it took up with it after you jettisoned the first and second stages. And two things I just want to tell you about, because you've all known everything. You've had it for a whole week, and you know all the story and what happens. But I want to point out to you the following features. First of all, that there is this launch escape system. The command module is down here, and there's a parachute system there. But if the launch fails, as it did, we were used to it in the late 50s and 60s, that the rocket goes up a few feet and then it comes crashing down. Well, what would you do then? The answer is you'd fire the launch escape system, 
which pulls up the uh, lunar module to a high enough place in orbit so that then if you uh, let go, you've got enough height to, for the parachutes to work. The other thing I want to explain to you is that, see that command module up there and the service module down here? And the lunar module is down below. That's for technical reasons of how you can package the whole thing. So I just wanted to point that out. I'll tell you about it later. And, well, we have liftoff. And uh, here are some stages of the liftoff. And uh, all went well. You didn't need the uh, uh, launch escape system. So as soon as you're up high enough, you jettison the launch escape system. And then what comes next? Well, here is Cape Canaveral. And you launch straight up to get as fast as you can over the uh, atmosphere where there's friction. And then you turn over towards the uh, east, of course, because that's where you pick up the Earth's rotational speed too. And you keep going, and uh, you, uh, after the first stage burnout, uh, you fire the second stage, and after the second stage, uh, you're up almost as high as it will go, what's known as the apogee, the furthest distance from the Earth. And then you ignite the third stage just for a little while to, what's the point about that? Well, you circularize the orbit. So it goes round and round. You test the systems, everything is fine. Uh, you're almost ready to fire the um, third stage again to put you onto a trajectory towards the moon. So about here, you burn stage three. You've gotten rid of stages one and two by then. Stage three ignites and goes into uh, the trajectory towards the moon. You don't point at the moon. I'll explain that later. You point in a direction which is easily calculated uh, after the right uh, uh, time that the navigational computers tell you about, and away you go. So you're now on the way to the, towards the moon, and uh, here's the same view again, only by this time something else happens, and I'll come to explain that in the next slide. As I said, Oops, sorry, I've done it again. The, um, here we are. Command module up there, service module next to it, uh, the instrument unit, third stage, and at this stage you're still carrying the lunar module, but as I said, it's down below. So what do you do? Well, you lift off the command and service module after shedding some of the fairing, and you rotate it right around using smaller thrusters until it points <laughs> downwards. At that stage, you are ready to dock with the uh, lunar module, which is down below. So once you've got that, you've got that below the other one, and this happens not too far into the orbit. You have to get the astronauts to open the hatches from there and go down into the lunar module and check out the systems. At this stage, I'm in my lab here at the university, and I get an urgent phone call. Channel 2, come quick. There's pictures coming from space. Good heavens. We'll send a taxi. They send a taxi for me. <laughs> <laughs> coming to the studios in Gordon Street, Elstonwick, and uh, come in quick, the bloke, the producer is waiting for me there. There's a young man called uh, John Vandenbelt. Uh, unfortunately, he died young. Terrific guy. He comes in, no makeup, no nothing, just sit down here. Camera's pointed at me, bright lights turn on. Um, this is Mr. Klein, he's gonna tell us what goes on up there. <laughs> 
luckily I had read the uh, um, press kit because that's what we academics are good at. You read the stuff and next morning you come and regurgitate it. <laughs> well, I was ready. I knew what was going on. I knew that they had to now connect the uh, command module where the three of them were sitting to the lunar module where two of them have to go down. And how do you connect that? Well, there has to be a vacuum tight shield closing them both, um, which had to be opened. And I remembered being impressed by this bit in the press kit that this is like two umbrellas back to back. This umbrella seals off that and this umbrella seals off that and they can both be opened from inside the uh, command module. So I explained that direct to camera because they were this crappy little monitor, black and white, sitting down there, and I vaguely recognized this shadowy shape of this thing, so I explained it, just like I explained it to you now, and this impressed the hell out of the <laughs> producers that I was able to explain that. After that, anything I said was gospel. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my sort of um, baptism of fire. Yes, I can do it, I can explain things. Okay, so we now have, hello, what happened here? Okay, um, this is the whole kit and caboodle that goes towards the moon. This is the service module and the engine, and they're off. Now, as I said, you don't point the thing at the moon, because the moon is down there, still coming up there. You point this thing towards the point where the moon will be when the thing got there. Um, it, this transfer orbit, uh, according to Kepler's laws, is a conic section. It is an ellipse, and this is a circle where you were in uh, parking orbit, and the two are connected by this elliptical thing. Trouble is that, again, due to Kepler's laws, this part of the business is a long way from the Earth, and it's very slow. So you don't want that. You want to actually aim for beyond that. You want to aim beyond that so it's a bit quicker. So now let's see how you went from there on. <laughs> Who's he? <laughs> Fifty years, the ravages of time. <laughs> By the way, you notice that it was a silent film. <laughs> what happened to the voice? Well, this was taken on a 16 millimeter film, and the voice came on a magnetic tape, and guess where it is? Well, your guess is as good as mine, because the ABC have lost it. <laughs> so, um, I'll tell you later why, but I did this orbit simulation using the little computer and the parking altitude in miles because NASA speaks miles and the launch velocity was 24,566 and the moon lead time was 96.5 hours so the moon is still 96 when, when you launch. So here we go, dot, 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 calculation on this uh, ancient PDP-15 computer which had 24 kilobytes of memory. <laughs> Mind you, on the uh, command module, they had 70 kilobytes. How's that? <laughs> um, OK, after an hour, you're down to 12,000 miles per hour. And after hour by hour, it's going slower and slower as you're going towards the moon. So here it is. And you can visibly see it slowing down. And hey, what's this coming up? That ladies and gentlemen, is the moon coming up there. And the moon is going in a steady speed in its own elliptical orbit, almost circular, and it's going towards that point there, just marks where they're going to, going to meet. Uh, yeah, this gets a bit boring, but it's going slowly. <laughs> and eventually, uh, 
we're going to get there. There's some way of speeding this up, but uh, thank you, Roger, you know how to do it, but I don't want to, it'll get there eventually. Um, so what will happen? So far, it's all going under the Earth's gravitational field. The moon, being so much lighter, has much less gravitational field, and you've got to get really close before. You can just about see it curved over. It's pulled down by the moon, and it's only right at the end that you're going to woof, and I'll tell you about it later, but there you are. Now, the purpose of making this film, part, partly for my own amusement, is, as I told you, the uh, trajectory here that we saw uh, that arrives at the moon, you launch it at 24,566 miles per hour. What if you launch it 10 kilometers per hour more quickly? Well, what you're going to do is you're going to get there sooner, and by the time the moon got there, it's going to take this orbit, which I'll talk to you about later, which is very important. But it won't be uh, crashing into the moon. It will go close behind it. Then let's go again with 24,556 miles per hour. Sorry, that's too slow. The moon has been and gone. And this just gets picked up a bit and thrown out into the solar system. So the point is that you have to have a very high accuracy. The launch velocity, 25,560 miles per hour, plus 10, zero, or minus 10. And you simply can't organize the uh, third stage burn to be quite this accurate. So what are you going to do? How are you going to make up for this? Well, there is an answer. The answer is called mid-course corrections. How do you do? You're at some uh, distance away from the Earth, and you, make a, a, you adjust the direction. Of course, you have to have it pointing the right way, and then give it a burst of the service module engine, which will then correct the thing. How do you know which way to do it? Well, from the spacecraft, you look back at the uh, Earth um, orbit uh, tangentially, the sort of horizon of the Earth. And then there is also, you look at a star. Now, what star? It turns out that that is the brightest star in the southern hemisphere. It's called Canopus. And yes, you can see it if you look for the brightest star. But you then measure this angle and adjust things so that it's just the right orientation so that it will uh, put us into the right trajectory to the moon. Meanwhile, the moon is, was here at launch, and after one day, it's there. After two days, it's there. Three days, it'll be at the meeting point. But you've got to arrange this to be the right tangential distance from the moon at that time. So how do you do that? Well. Um, uh, here it is at the top here. Sorry, this is a messy slide with all the other things on it, but here it is, uh, mid-course correction, uh, another correction there. And when you're behind the moon, as it turns out, you have to be about, uh, I forget how many miles uh, above the moon, and then you fire the retro rockets, and what do you do? You slow down the thing so that uh, it gets into uh, its, I think it burns for six minutes, and then you get into lunar orbit. And after the orbit, you again, you first you circularize it, and you go around a couple of times to figure out where you were. <laughs> and then uh, you fire the descent engine. I may have forgotten to tell you that sometime before this, you've got the crew transfer. The two guys who are going to land go down into the lunar module, shut off the double umbrella, and poor uh, Collins is left to go in uh, lunar orbit round and round and round a couple of times, whilst Armstrong and Aldrin have fired the um, 
retro rockets for the descent. So now we're in a descent mode, and right at the end here, when they're about 15 kilometers away, he says, not entirely clear exactly how it happened, but I think what Armstrong then said, here, let me have it, and took the controls away and manually guided the thing to go all the way down. There was a bit of drama because uh, right down to where they are um, here, hoping to uh, land at the predetermined point, uh, here is uh, two things happened. High drama, they get a 12.04 alarm. What the hell is that all about? Just ignore it. <laughs> Armstrong's heart rate hardly went up from 130 to 150. Uh, I mean, if I said boo to you, your heart rate would go up that far, but no, he's a trained, cool test pilot, well-trained, and that's why he was selected. So he comes all the way down, and almost at the point where he has to touch down, he sees a field of boulders and a crater. And he says, whoops, now I can't land here. The alarm that went off, I just ignore it. Meanwhile, the ground crew realizes what this alarm was. It says, uh, you're running out of fuel. Ignore it. He goes past the point where he's supposed to land for another 200 meters. By this time, they're right near where I can sort of smell the flowers. And uh, no, there's no flowers on the moon. And uh, keep going, and finally sets it down. You hear the voice of Aldrin saying, there was a big long wire probe saying, that touches the surface. And he says, Touchdown. Engines off. Turns the engines off. At this stage, they're a couple of meters from the ground. Bang, straight down. Uh, everybody breathes a great sigh of relief, but there they are. Um, whoops, what am I doing? Uh, there they are. They came in uh, to, th to there. And so they land. Uh, the eagle has landed. And then you expect things to happen. And guess what happens? Nothing. They're in there, cooped up. They're checking where they are. They're scheduled to have a rest. Hell, they don't want to have a rest. They want to get on there and get on with it. No, you can't. Not until you can see it from the Earth. They have radio communications. There's the uh, evening news coming on in the USA. No, you can't go just yet because you can't, we can't see you. Wait till Australia can see you. So that's when the Australian tracking stations came in. As soon as they connected, they had pictures. Send a picture back to Houston in time for the evening news. Terrific. And uh, Australia heard it first. So um, this is the descent phase. Uh, this is the long piece of wire that touched down first, and they're almost bang down there. And, uh, yep, then after waiting for, I forget how long, I've forgotten, it was a long time ago, uh, 50 years ago, I read the uh, uh, press kit manual, so I forget how long, but finally they opened the door, uh, and there was a ladder, and there was another thing with a camera pointing at him with a very crappy slow scan camera and takes the famous pictures. Uh, the eagle has landed and uh, there's a last step. The last step is actually quite high when you look at their more recent pictures, but that's all right because there's only one sixth of the gravity so it can take a long leap. So that was, it was a great uh, a small step for man, but a big leap. That was a, quite a big leap for man, too. But of course, in a sixth gravity, it hardly matters. Uh, much later, some hours later, Aldrin steps down. Hey, how come these pictures are so much clearer? That's all right. That's um, Armstrong with a Hasselblad camera taking a good color photograph. Uh, you couldn't do this, couldn't see this at, you didn't see it at the time. So what are they going to do now? Well, they establish the uh, uh, was it called Tranquility Base, which is what they call the area where they landed. And the important thing that they're going to do there is put down all these various instruments, the instrument package. Now, what is this instrument package? It has a seismograph. Um, 
I don't have a demo of the seismograph, but let me describe to you, uh, because after Apollo 12, we did 13. After <laughs> Apollo 11, we did Apollo 12, Apollo 13, Apollo 14, Apollo 15, and there was always a, an interviewer to uh, keep me in line and ask me questions. And Apollo 15, or was it 16? There was a very attractive young lady called uh, Sally White, uh, was working for the ABC at the time, wearing a miniskirt and a tightly laced uh, bodice, and she helped me with a seismograph. What's a seismograph? It's just an inertial mass. Think of a brick hanging by a fine thread. And uh, this was all mounted on a table and a piece of this white computer paper, and she got hold of the computer and walked away with it at a steady velocity, and I was shaking the table. So guess what you see on the thing? You see a squiggle, which is what the acceleration is. The inertial mass is staying put because of its inertia, and the moon was moving because of a moon, cake, moon quake. So this was one of the instruments that stayed on the moon, and the other one uh, was um, a thing called a corner cube. What is a corner cube? It's actually an array of corner cubes, and I'll demonstrate one in a minute, but uh, a corner cube is, think of three mirrors. Uh, hell. <laughs> there. Um, Light comes in, bounces off one mirror, exactly 90 degrees to it is another mirror, another bounce, another bounce on the third mirror, all these mirrors precisely at 90 degrees, and then it comes back, the laser beam comes back exactly the way it came. Um, here is a, look, I'll skip the demonstration, virtual demonstrations like you've just seen me explain um, the three mirrors. Um, that always works. <laughs> How will I virtually recover this? <laughs> Who's running this show, Rog? Uh, yeah. oh, good on you. <laughs> yep, okay, so here is the uh, corner cubes, array of corner cubes, and what's the point about this? It can be illuminated from the Earth by a laser beam driven through a telescope. It covers quite a large area by the time it gets to the moon. But it gets reflected exactly the way back. And you pick it up with the same telescope about a quarter of a second, uh, two and a half seconds later. Why? Because of the speed of light from here to there and back. And if you measure the time, you can deduce the distance. And by now, this distance from the Earth to the moon can be me measured with huge precision of about, uh, the moon is moving away from us at uh, about four centimeters per annum. Using this thing on the moon, they got it down to 3.965421. Uh, so in a, what's the point about this? Why is the moon getting further and further up? Well, because some of the energy contained in its orbital speed, some of that energy is used up in friction by tides. So it's the tides produced by the moon that are slowing it down, and slowing it down, according to Kepler's laws, makes it move out further. Uh, so this was, and there's yet another instrument, and that was measuring or catching solar wind. Luckily, we don't get that here because our Earth's magnetic field is deflecting the protons and other charged particles coming from the sun, mainly protons. And um, they had a thing there that caught these uh, uh, solar uh, wind particles. So that was the other instrument. While I'm here, I have to tell you a sad fact. None of this could have been ne needed people to uh, instrument them. You could have had unmanned, uncrewed, uh, instruments taking all these things to the moon. So I don't want to de detract this huge cultural achievement, this absolute pinnacle of American technology, absolute pinnacle of human achievement that rep is represented by this man on the moon program, but actually could have easily 
and much more cheaply done by uncrewed uh, things that have happened since by having all things going to the moon with uh, much fancier instruments. So back to the uh, game. Uh, the other thing they did was, of course, propaganda. And you've all seen this and this and this and this, the defining photograph of the 20th century, something quite, quite fantastic. Uh, of course, this was not taken by them. This was taken by color cameras much later. And uh, uh, it still represents one of mankind's greatest achievements, and there's no uh, taking away from that. OK, so when you've done all that, uh, your extravehicular activity, you climb back into the box. Uh, you have a prescribed rest, which they uh, objected against because they were all terribly excited. You close the hatch, and you, <coughs> you set off uh, again for Earth. You close the hatch, you fire this uh, ascent rockets, you leave behind the descent uh, because you don't need that anymore, and you have these much smaller rocket to take you up back into orbit, back into this circular orbit where uh, Michael Collins is patiently waiting for you. Uh, you've been on the surface for 21 and a half approximately hours and did all these things, but there we go again. So here it is, this time you launch. No, you don't. Where are we? You launch back towards the thing, the circular orbit, chasing. I lost myself here. Luckily, they didn't hear it. Is the ascent. And here you go into this mode where you are chasing the uh, command module with Collins in it. Um, and you can see um, the command module from the lunar module getting near, the, near that. And at the same time, Collins is looking down, looking for them, and he can see the lunar module approaching them. And um, miraculously, as I said, they're great navigators. They're used to flying test missions all the time, and they find each other. Uh, of course, the burn was exactly programmed at the right time, and the computer took them there. But nevertheless, they, they find each other. And then there's this docking. The two of them meet again. A crew transfer. The two guys go back through this tunnel with the two umbrellas. They close the two umbrellas. They're now in there, the three of them, in the command module. And uh, there we go. They fire the... Um, service module, big rocket, the only thing they left, and they're back into uh, the Earth trajectory. Meanwhile, of course, they've got to do some more course corrections. I'm using the same diagram here showing how they orient the thing and how they get it exactly right. So they will arrive in Earth orbit, and when they finish, they jettison the service module because there's no more need for it. And that all that's left is the command modules with the three guys coming towards Earth. And the only thing they now have to do is orient it correctly. Because if they orient it too steeply, it will burn up and as soon as it reaches the atmosphere. And it's the atmospheric friction that slows it down. Um, if it's uh, too shallow an angle, it just bounces off the Earth's atmosphere and goes out into space and no longer have any rockets to correct it with, so this correction is absolutely vital. But they got it right. The, all these things that had to go right for this whole thing, I mean, I'm talking to you about 10 or so episodes, but there were hundreds of them. And the fine timeline in the, in the uh, nest, press kit, I had to keep following it, because a lot of the time there's nothing to be seen. You can hear them, Houston, Apollo, etc., and they could be. But as soon as the 
reach the atmosphere, the outer regions of the atmosphere, this great flame and fire dissipates its kinetic energy and it produces such plasma that you can no longer transmit radio through it. So you can't hear a thing. You just hope they're all right. Several minutes later, again, they breathe a great sigh of relief. Um, you've had the deorbit. You have to jettison the engine, re-entry, this thing I've described, and then splash down. You can't see them because they're inside, but there's this crew with a, an inflatable coming to get them. After the parachutes open, you've all seen those pictures. So that's about the end of the story. Everything went right, and it's absolutely amazing the hundreds of different things, maneuvers. I've left out so many. I've spoken to you about a few of them just to explain how things went, but it was absolutely miraculous. Finally, they got down there. So that's all that went right with Apollo 11. Here's an overview of the whole thing of what I've spoken to uh, so far. Here was the launch from Cape Canaveral, the parking orbit again towards the moon, reaching the moon there. Once they landed, they of course go together with the moon and that's when they turned around and uh, came back. That's when everything went right on Apollo 11 and it's an absolute miracle. Apollo 12 was pretty much the same sort of thing, except they were more uh, well equipped with uh, photographic and video equipment. So they arrive on the moon, they land, terrific, exactly the re retracing of the thing, and they set up a camera to transmit pictures back to Earth. It was a video camera on a tripod, and uh, what we could see down here is a picture wobbling about as they try and set up this camera on the tripod. And then, and then, suddenly it went blank. Oh my God, what's happened? Uh, I tell the technical crew with the two-inch Ampex videotape recorder, wind back a few frames. And what you see at that stage was a row of dots of light, like you see when you point the camera uh, the wrong way, and every lens surface gives a reflection and there's all this like a row of dots in a line. And sure enough, the last picture shows all these things in a line pointing towards the sun. So the silly so-and-so, I forget which one it was, pointed the thing directly at the sun, burnt out the video tube, and that was the end of the pictures. I'm left with the rest of the what they do on the moon and how they come back to Earth and the splashdown. The splashdown was documented from outside and the opening of the parachute. But did I have anything to talk about? No pictures. That was hard work. What we did for, I mean, they, they had plenty of notice, of course, uh, another four days. We cut up the press kit, got the pictures out, pasted them onto a black, black piece of cardboard, and the rest of the time, I had the pictures at least to show and talk to. Uh, it was very hard work, I can tell you. It was even harder work for Apollo 13. What went right with Apollo 13 is that it was possible to get this free return trajectory, which I'm going to describe now. The point is... Um, same picture, but you don't aim it at the moon because meanwhile, about here, they had this gigantic blow up, one of their uh, uh, fuel cells on the service module blew up. This put the whole mission into uh, jeopardy. No way could you then land on the moon. You try and return from the moon. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you can't turn around and come back. You can't drive it like you drive a car on an airplane. You are in orbit. You have to follow this orbit and change the orbit if you can. And luckily, there is a mode whereby. Watch closely. 
you don't burn on the other side of the moon because you're not going to land. You let it go around the moon, one of these trajectories that I described that comes back. And again, this is a bit boring, but you can watch this thing, the free return, this kind of, it goes in a boomerang trajectory, in a free return trajectory. And in a moment, I will try and explain this to you of how come. But uh, luckily, it is possible. You've got to have just the right angle. And it came back and splashed down and the people were saved. Um, it's really, in a way, almost as miraculous that this is possible as the Apollo 11 and 12, which were successful. This was the thing that allowed compensators for the uh, uh, problem, and it saved them. Uh, yeah, it'll come back to Earth. Uh, when he's finished explaining this. Meanwhile, he's talking. That's where he's uh, missing uh, the missing tape with the voice on it, which explains what goes on now. Just as I said, I mean, it's a bit boring. It, it, it get, comes back. And uh, the same procedure of orienting it and splash down. OK, here we are. There, he's explaining it. Now, shut up. Let me do it. <laughs> uh, I'll try and explain to you. Here is the elliptical orbit that it goes on if there's no moon there. Here is one of the uh, orbits that it goes on if it's just the right speed and just the right course correction. And indeed, it comes back to here. Uh, how come? Well, if you look at this, not from the point of view of what the Earth looks like, but what it looks like from the point of view of the moon. In physics, we call this changing the, the uh, frame of reference. The frame of reference is not from the Earth looking up there, but from up there looking towards the Earth. What does that look like? Well, it came in very fast, and it's not an ellipse. It is a hyperbola. A hyperbola is another conic section uh, which we used to talk about and teach in first year physics and in schools indeed. And this hyperbola is a conic section with an eccentricity greater than one. Eccentricity zero, it's a circle. Between zero and one, it's an ellipse. Greater than one, it is a hyperbola. It comes in at a velocity greater than the moon's escape velocity. So that's why it's turned around. And the hyperbola is characterized, unlike the ellipse, which has a finite major axis, and minor axis. This thing is characterized by the eccentricity and the angle between these lines called asymptotes. Uh, between 86 degrees and 88 degrees, you have to be pretty accurate. Uh, when you turn this uh, hairpin, around, can you imagine, can you imagine that this uh, hairpin looked at from the Earth, you turn around, uh, the legs of a hairpin get turned over. And that's the relation between what you see here and what you see there. This um, picture here is that hairpin turned over. And it is only possible for angles which are just right, which in turn are, pos are possible by having the distance uh, when the uh, traject incoming trajectory turns over, turns over, how far it is from the, uh, from the moon. Uh, to go any further, I would need calculus. So if you send me an email, I'll send you a copy of the paper that I wrote in, I think, 1971 or 72, published in the Australian Physicist. I'll get you the paper with a bit of calculus. It can explain to you mathematically how this comes about. This change of frame of reference 
It's an old trick used by NASA. One of them, for example, is you want to go to Mars? Okay, or to further out in space? You don't aim at outer space, you aim at Venus. Why? Because Venus is going around pretty much faster than the Earth. So you go near Venus and you get this slingshot effect. You go close to Venus, which gives you a kick, and that sends you out to, uh, to outer space. Um, and this is just an example of that. So that's the uh, story so far of what went right and what went wrong and what went, how they corrected it when it went wrong. Okay, so that was a prologue, the main text. Now I want to say a bit about um, an epilogue, the mission to Mars. Here it is, the Earth in its orbit, trying to um, go to Mars, which goes more slowly. So you catch up with it, because you're going more quickly, because you're closer to the sun. Mars goes more slowly. The so year is much longer on Mars. So here it is. You're getting closer and closer and closer. And finally, after 160 days in this particular case, uh, of uh, the uh, flight of Mariner, you arrive um, 160 hours later, 160 days later, you arrive at Mars. Well, that's great. Uh, what do you do with it? If you have a crew on board, well, same thing. Here is the uh, Earth departure. This was uh, uh, calculated in 2014 and uh, arrives in 2016, um, sorry, where is it now? From here to here, uh, it arrives in uh, about 160 or whatever the number is, that many days, 160 days. So it's possible to have a crewed mission with uh, people sitting in a capsule and arriving here. But can you get them back? Or is this a suicide mission? The only way you can come back is to wait for the moon. Wait on, the, uh, sorry, not the moon, but Mars. You wait on the surface for 569 days before you can reach a point from where you can come down to Earth. There's no other way of doing it. In more detail, Outboard, 150 days. This is for a particular mission, okay? You have to stay 619 days and return in 110 days. Um, here's another one, possible mission times. You can calculate it, but you still have to wait for that long. So the total is 919 days. That's about uh, two and a half years before you can get, come back to Earth. The way that this was explained to me by uh, one of the visiting astronauts last September was because I came to Heckel in his lecture where he was describing how he was going to do it. And I said, this is suicide. He said, oh no, NASA wouldn't contemplate sending people on suicide missions. Well, maybe they won't, but the Chinese will for sure. <laughs> um, they have to send two supply missions, years apart, to put a depot, each of them, of enough food, enough water, and enough oxygen for people to survive two and a half days. I don't believe it. They're planning to do it in uh, 2024 or 26, whenever it is, and I don't believe it. I think this is a suicide mission, and unless they change their minds or explain to Donald Trump what I just explained to you, uh, NASA won't, won't be able to do this. So what's the answer? Now, please don't think that I'm talking against space exploration, because it's a fantastic ex uh, uh, adventure for mankind to see these things done only with uncrewed missions. As far as Mars is concerned, 
there was the thing that was launched, I think, in 2004 and had this vehicle on it, the Rover, stayed on for 14, uh, 14 years, sent back all kinds of data. It went all over the place and explored the geology of Mars, the stratigraphy, the different strata inside a crater. You can see the r different, uh, different places. It went all over the place and maybe they'll have even better, even more uh, elaborate things to send to Mars, but without a crew. No way, in my opinion, that this can be done uh, with a crew on board. But suppose they can. Suppose by some miracle they'll organize two and a half years worth of stuff that people can survive. I mean, they've been up there in the, um, International Space Station for, I don't know, six months uh, towards going for a year. Nothing's been gone for two and a half years yet, but uh, still. There are other ways of doing business without a crew on board. One of the most exciting ones is the next one that's being planned. And that's a mission to Titan. Titan is a satellite of Saturn. Uh, it has an atmosphere. You can use parachutes because there's an atmosphere. The atmosphere is not what we have here, but it's methane, which is a gas which is not yet frozen at this temperature. It's got rivers. It's got lakes. It's got all sorts of terrain, all made from uh, liquid methane, an atmosphere of gaseous methane and rivers and lakes of... It's fascinating. Let's see what they, wh what they find here. Um, it's going to be launched, I think, in 2024, and uh, I think it will get there in 2036, or maybe... Well, it doesn't have to return. It has no people on it. And so the mission will arrive on Titan and send us pictures and data and whatnot. And that's about as far as you can go outside the solar system and land on things. Conversely, you can go inside and go towards Venus, which is very hot. Uh, no way can you send people there, but you can for a short while before it melts, send back interesting data on the surface of Venus, and so on. So yes, I'm fully in favor of the science that is possible by sending uncrewed, unmanned objects as far as you can. And there's still an exciting future for uh, mankind to explore. They're going back to the moon. Yes, it is possible. They're sending people there. Again, I think in 2024, they'll launch uh, Project Artemis. I don't know what they can do on the moon when they get there that we can't do with uh, clever uh, unmanned missions. They want to go towards the uh, poles of uh, the moon to see if they find some frozen water, which is hypothesized that will ex exist there. Again, it can be done without sending people there. Sending people beyond the moon is certainly, in my opinion, suicidal. So that's my view of the thing. There are lots of people who disagree with me, and there are in particular uninformed people who think that by dirtying up the Earth, there is Earth B somewhere to be found, like Mars, and you cultivate it and uh, plant radishes and so forth. <laughs> Pure nonsense. That much is not possible. Don't pin your hopes that we dirty up our Earth that we'll find somewhere else to go. There's nowhere else to go. So that's my story. I'm sorry if I offended people who strongly believe that it's wonderful to go and send uh, men and women to some of these places. Uh, maybe go back to the moon and maybe take a woman with you just to show that it can be done. But <laughs> otherwise, <laughs> otherwise um, stay on Earth and look after it. <laughs>